The Golden-Haired Twins Once upon a time, a long, long while ago, there lived a young king who wished very much to marry, but could not decide where he had better look for a wife. One evening as he was walking disguised through the streets of his capital, as it was his frequent custom to do, he stopped to listen near an open window where he heard three young girls chatting gaily together. The girls were talking about a report which had been lately spread through the city, that the king intended soon to marry. One of the girls exclaimed, If the king would marry me I would give him a son who should be the greatest hero in the world. The second girl said, And if I were to be his wife I would present him with two sons at once two twins with golden hair, and the third girl declared that were the king to marry her she would give him a daughter so beautiful that there should not be her equal in the whole wide world. The young king listened to all this, and for some time thought over their words, and tried to make up his mind which of the three girls he should choose for his wife. At last he decided that he would marry the one who had said she would bring him twins with golden hair. Having once settled this in his own mind, he ordered that all preparations for his marriage should be made forthwith, and shortly after, when all was ready, he married the second girl of the three. Several months after his marriage, the young king, who was at war with one of the neighboring princes, received tidings of the defeat of his army, and heard that his presence was immediately required in the camp. He accordingly left his capital and went to his army leaving the young queen in his palace to the care of his stepmother. Now the king's stepmother hated her daughter-in-law very much indeed, so when the golden-haired twins were born, the old queen contrived to steal them out of their cradle, and put in their place two ugly little dogs. She then caused the two beautiful golden-haired boys to be buried alive in and out of the way spot in the palace gardens, and then sent word to the king that the young queen had given him two little dogs instead of the heirs he was hoping for. The wicked stepmother said in her letter to the king that she herself was not surprised at this, though she was very sorry for his disappointment. As to herself, she had a long time suspected the young queen of having too great a friendship for goblins and elves, and all kinds of evil spirits. When the king received this letter, he fell into a frightful rage, because he had only married the young girl in order to have the golden-haired twin she had promised him as heirs to his throne. So he sent word back to the old queen that his wife should be put at once into the dampest dungeon in the castle, an order which the wicked woman took good care to see carried out without delay. Accordingly the poor young queen was thrown into a miserably dark dungeon under the palace, and kept on bread and water. Now there was only a very small hole in this prison, hardly large enough to let in light and air, yet the old queen managed to cause a great many people to pass by this hole and whoever passed was ordered to spit at and abuse the unhappy young queen, calling out to her, Are you really the queen? Are you the girl who cheated the king in order to be a queen? Where are your golden-haired twins? You cheated the king and your friends, and now the witches have cheated you. But the young king, though terribly angry and mortified at his great disappointment, was, at the same time, too sad and troubled to be willing to return to his palace so he remained away for fully nine years. When he at last consented to return, the first thing he noticed in the palace gardens were two fine young trees, exactly the same size and the same shape. These trees had both golden leaves and golden blossoms, and had grown up of themselves from the very spot where the stepmother of the king had buried the two golden-haired boys she had stolen from their cradle. The king admired these two trees exceedingly, and was never weary of looking at them. This however, did not at all please the old queen, for she knew that the two young princes were buried just where the trees grew, and she always feared that by some means what she had done would come to the king's ears. She therefore pretended that she was very sick, and declared that she was sure she should die unless her stepson, the king, ordered the two golden leaved trees to be cut down, and a bed made for her out of their wood, as the king was not willing to be the cause of her death. He ordered that her wishes should be attended to, although he was exceedingly sorry to lose his favorite trees. A bed was soon made from the two trees, and the seemingly sick old queen was laid on it as she desired. She was quite delighted that the golden leaf trees had disappeared from the garden, but when midnight came she could not sleep a bit, for it seemed to her that she heard the boards of which her bed was made in conversation with each other. At last it seemed to her that one board said, quite plainly, How are you? my brother. And the other board answered, thank you, 
I am very well, how are you? Oh, I am all right, returned the first board, but I wonder how our poor mother is in her dark dungeon. Perhaps she is hungry and thirsty, the wicked old queen could not sleep a minute all night, after hearing this conversation between the boards of her new bed, so next morning she got up very early and went to see the king. She thanked him for attending to her wish, and said she already was much better, but she felt quite sure she would never recover thoroughly unless the boards of her new bed were cut up and thrown into a fire. The king was sorry to lose entirely even the boards made out of his two favorite trees, nevertheless he could not refuse to use the means pointed out for his stepmother's perfect recovery, so the new bed was cut to pieces and thrown into the fire. But whilst the boards were blazing and crackling, two sparks from the fire flew into the courtyard, and in the next moment two beautiful lambs with golden fleeces and golden horns were seen gambling about the yard, the king admired them greatly and made many inquiries who had sent them there, and to whom they belonged. He even sent the public crier many times through the city, calling on the owners of the golden fleece lambs to appear and claim them, but no one came, so at length he thought he might fairly take them as his own property. The king took very great care of these two beautiful lambs, and every day directed that they should be well fed and attended to. This, however, did not at all please his stepmother. She could not endure even to look on the lambs with their golden fleeces and golden horns, for they always reminded her of the golden-haired twins. So, in a little while she pretended again to be dangerously sick, and declared she felt sure she should soon die unless the two lambs were killed and cooked for her. The king was even fonder of his golden fleeced lambs than he had been of the golden leaf trees, but he could not long resist the tears and prayers of the old queen, especially as she seemed to be very ill. Accordingly, the lambs were killed, and a servant was ordered to carry their golden fleeces down to the river and to wash them well. But whilst the servant held them under the water, they slipped, in some way or another, out of his fingers, and floated down the stream, which just at that place flowed very rapidly. Now it happened that a hunter was passing near the river a little lower down, and, as he chanced to look in the water, he saw something strange in it. So he stepped into the stream, and soon fished out a small box which he carried to his house and there opened it. To his unspeakably great surprise, he found in the box two golden-haired boys. Now the hunter had no children of his own, he therefore adopted the twins he had fished out of the river, and brought them up just as if they had been his own sons. When the twins were grown up into handsome young men, one of them said to his foster father, Make us two suits of beggar's clothes and let us go and wander a little about the world. The hunter, however, replied and said, No, I will have a fine suit made for each of you, such as is fitting for two such noble-looking young men. But as the twins begged hard that he should not spend his money uselessly in buying fine clothes, telling him that they wished to travel about as beggars, the hunter, who always liked to do as his two handsome foster sons wished, did as they desired, and ordered two suits of clothes like those worn by beggars, to be prepared for them. The two sons then dressed themselves up as beggars, and as well as they could hid their beautiful golden locks, and then set out to see the world. They took with them a guzzle one and a cymbal, and maintained themselves with their singing and playing. They had wandered about in this way some time when one day they came to the king's palace. As the afternoon was already pretty far advanced, the young musicians begged to be allowed to pass the night in one of the outbuildings belonging to the court, as they were poor men, and quite strangers in the city. The old queen, however, who happened to be just then in the courtyard saw them, and hearing their request, said sharply that beggars could not be permitted to enter any part of the king's palace. The two travelers said they had hoped to pay for their night's lodging by their songs and music, as one of them played and sung to the guzzle and the other to the symbol. The old queen, however, was not moved by this, but insisted on their going away at once. Happily for the two brothers the king himself came out into the courtyard just as his stepmother angrily ordered them to go away, and at once directed his servants to find a place for the musicians to sleep in, and ordered them to provide the brothers with a good supper. After they had supped, the king commanded them to be brought before him that he might judge of their skill as musicians and that their singing might help him to pass the time more pleasantly. Accordingly, 
After the two young men had taken the refreshment provided for them, the servants took them into the king's presence, and they began to sing this ballad. The pretty bird, the swallow, built her nest with care, in the palace of the king. In the nest she reared up happily two of her little ones. A black, ugly-looking bird, however, came to the swallow's nest to mar her happiness, and to kill her two little ones. And the ugly black bird succeeded in destroying the happiness of the poor little swallow, the little ones, however, although yet weak and unfledged, were saved, and, when they were grown up and able to fly, they came to look at the palace where their mother, the pretty swallow, had built her nest. This strange song the two minstrels sang so very sweetly that the king was quite charmed, and asked them the meaning of the words. Whereupon the two meanly dressed young men took off their hats, so that the rich dresses of their golden hair fell down over their shoulders, and the light glanced so brightly upon it that the whole hall was illuminated by the shining. They then stepped forward together, and told the king all that had happened to them and to their mother, and convinced him that they were really his own sons. The king was exceedingly angry when he heard all the cruel things his stepmother had done, and he gave orders that she should be burned to death. He then went with the two golden-haired princes to the miserable dungeon wherein his unfortunate wife had been confined so many years, and brought her once more into her beautiful palace. There, looking on her golden-haired sons, and seeing how much the king, their father, loved them, she soon forgot all her long years of misery. As to the king, he felt that he could never do enough to make amends for all the misfortunes his queen had lived through, and all the dangers to which his twin sons had been exposed. He felt that he had too easily believed the stories of the old queen, because he would not trouble himself to inquire more particularly into the truth or falsehood of the strange things she had told him. After all this mortification, and trouble, and misery, everything came right at last. So the king and his wife, with their golden-haired twins, lived together long and happily.